Hello, welcome to LTV's Top Props. I'm Carl Pimarini. Today we're going to talk about a film that has gone down into sci-fi history. In 1960, producer-director George Pal, who was famous as being one of the forefathers of science fiction film, bringing us films like Destination Moon, When Worlds Collide, in War of the Worlds, George decided to do something a little different. He contacted the H.G. Wells estate and got the rights to one of H.G. Wells' most famous books. In the process, little did he know he was creating a legend in film history. The film he was talking about and that he was getting ready to produce is what we are going to focus on today especially one of the iconic props from that film. Of course, what I'm talking about is this. The Time Machine. It took the creative magic of George Pal and the fabulous production know-how of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer to catapult you through time into a world that is yet to be. Why is it that we usually ignore the fourth dimension? You see, we can move in the other three. As the doctor said, up, down, forwards, backwards, sideways. But when it comes to time, we are prisoners. Inventor Rod Taylor's breakthrough into the realm of the fourth dimension is defied by his friend Alan Young. If that machine can do what you say it can, destroy it, George, before it destroys you. Every moment is a year, hurtling through the atomic wars of the future on an incredible excursion into the unknown. Is this the human race of the future? Or is this the Morlocks, fiendish creatures who live in a weird underground world? And the Eloi, the tranquil sunshine people, who the Morlocks dominate and maintain like cattle, luring them below with the hypnotic wail of the sirens to feed upon them in cannibalistic horror. Okay, to get some background information on this iconic prop, I know a lot of the props we've talked about in this series, we call them iconic. This is one of the, the iconic props. But to talk about this, we're going to uh, have a discussion with Mr. Don Coleman out in Burbank, California. Now, Don is the webmaster of one of the best websites regarding the 1960 George Pal film, The Time Machine. So we're going to uh, Skype in and talk to Don Coleman, and, and he's pretty knowledgeable on the whole history and background of the 1960 George Pal film, and especially this prop here, which is a replica I built years ago, and we'll talk about that later on. But for now, let's, uh, let's talk to Don Coleman. Okay, today we are going to talk to a good friend of mine, Mr. Don Coleman out in Burbank, California. Don, how are you? I'm doing great today, Carl. Very good. Uh, Don and I have never met personally. We've talked to each other many times on the phone. Someday I plan to get out to Burbank, but uh, we'll haven't get gotten there yet. So we'll, we'll get there. Anyway, Don, why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself, a, a quick little uh, bio. All right. Uh, I was born in Culver City, which is the heart of Screenland, which is when I was about four blocks from MGM Studios. So it was kind of my backyard when I grew up. On the way to junior high and high school, I had to walk right past slot two every day. So that was really neat to peek in the get gates and see what was going on inside there. And then I got hooked on TV shows and whatever, and I would see something on the, sh on the movie or in the TV series that I wanted, and you couldn't go buy stuff like that in those days. So I learned how to make stuff. And 
George Pell's film, The Time Machine, really caught my attention as a kid when I first saw it and just started building scratch models after that. But before, before that, I was doing the model kits, you know, do standard off-the-shelf stuff. So that's how I got started. And my dad was a carpenter, so we had a garage full of tools. I was probably working a radial arm saw by the time I was eight. <laughs> you know, so uh, various jobs growing up, and then uh, some friends of mine started their own stu their own. I think it's called a studio, uh, the makeup company. And at one point, uh, they asked me to come work for them, so I went over there and was doing props and stuff. From then on, that was around '86. Okay, so you've been in the business for, for quite a few years, but what I yeah. want to do is kind of turn back the clocks, again, back to uh, 1960 or so. Did you, uh, when was the first time you actually saw the Time Machine movie, the 1960 I movie? Saw, I saw it first run in August of 1960 when it hit Culver City. And I think it was a, it was a fluke, because we were supposed to go to another, another theater to watch another movie my cousin was with, and she didn't want to go see that movie, so we went to see the Time Machine instead. So very lucky circumstances, I think. What was it um, about that movie that kind of stayed with you all those years going forward? I think the, the, the machine itself was really intriguing. You know, we hadn't seen anything that looked like that ever before. And I think what really stuck my mind was the fact that he supposedly built it in his own shop, in his garage, basically. And I thought, if he can do it, I can do it, <laughs> you know? So from that day on, I pretty much had in my mind how I was going to build one of these things. It's always been in my mind. You know, it's, I don't know what it is about uh, the design of that machine. It appeals to a lot of people. I mean, a lot of younger viewers may know it from the Big Bang Theory. It was on there, and, and a lot of people know that machine from that, unless you're older. Um, and then, you, you know, you've seen reruns of the 1960 movie, Turner Classics plays it every once in a while. Um, right. So, um, you, you know, but many, many people, even younger people sometimes, are really attracted to the design of this machine. And uh, I'm not sure, any inkling as to why that is? I'm really not sure. I think it's possibly the way it's just presented in the movie, because they... The first time you see it, there's this huge uh, musical right. lift, you know, it was, it walks in the door and there's a slow pan around it. And, and my wife says, it's like George is making love to the machine when he walks up to it, he's caressing it, you know, like it's his girlfriend or something. It's just, I think, how it's presented really, you know, influenced people. <laughs> I said too, it's, it's so unusual looking. It's like, I know in the, in the novel they talked about it being askew and, and, and very other descriptions, but this thing is really unusual how it all fits together. And you know that because you built one too. Right. If one part isn't quite in the right place, other parts don't fit either. Right. And it's like, now what do we do? You know, so. Um, do you have any history as to? the design of the actual 1960 uh, pal, George Pal directed the 1960 film, From and, and the machine itself. Who designed the machine? All I've really been able to find out so far is that the mentor Goofner was involved with it. He was an art uh, designer at the time. Uh, William Ferrari had his hand into it, and I'm sure George Pal had the final okay on us. I'm sure he had influence into it. Um, some years ago, there was a design that came up on auction, and it was attributed to Wah Chang. It was an early design of the machine. Uh, I had seen Wah prior to that, a couple months prior to this auction coming up, so I called him up. He was still alive at the time. 
and asked him about it, and he said he had absolutely nothing to do with the design of the machine. Uh -huh. mm. When they got involved with it, the design was already finalized, and they just had to build a model to right. pretty much mimic what the full-size one looked like. So that's kind of what I know about it. I don't have any real detail as to who attributed what. There's an earlier sketch, which I believe Mentor drew, which is that one that looks like the electric chair with the dish behind it kind of thing. Right, right. That's the only preliminary drawing I've ever seen of it. You know, I kind of consider, uh, Don, I, I consider you one of the foremost experts on, on the Time Machine because Don created a, a website uh, called the Time Machine Project, which is off of the Coleman Zone uh, website. Is that where it's still located? Yeah, it's still there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for anybody that wants any information at all about the 1960 movie or the prop, uh, that's the place to go. Uh, all the information you ever need is, is on that page. But, Don, um, I know you originally saw the machine, the, the real prop, back in, what, 1970? Can you tell us that story, how that happened? Right. right. There was... Um well, prior to that, I always thought the movie was shot in England. Was, uh, the 8 by 10 gloss, color glossies all say printed in England on the, rock, on the corner. And there was a book out at the time, it was called Classics of the Foreign Film. And there was a big article about the time machine in it, and the guy said it was shot in England. So I was really surprised when in 1970 the MGM auction was taking place, and I found out the whole thing was shot in Culver City, my backyard. <laughs> wow. So first thing I did was order the catalog as soon as I found out you could buy one, because that's the only way you were going to get in is you had to have a catalog. So it was a whopping $10, which was a lot of money back in 1970. And so I got the catalog and went over there. And it was, the time machine actually was listed in two locations in the catalogs. One was said it was in lot three, another one said it was on lot one. First thing I did was I went to lot, I think it was at lot one three I went to first. And I went to where it said it was, and there was nothing in there but a two-headed turtle, which you saw on the Adams family at one point, and some other miscellaneous <laughs> larger props. The storage room, which is all really what was on lot three, was storage and sets and, and uh, setups and stuff. So I got to lot one and finally found the machine that was the full-size one in there. And when I first saw it, I really didn't even think it was the one from the movie. Because I just thought, you know, you have this envisionment of what you think it's supposed to look like. Exactly. It, you know, with a lot of movie props, it's the same way. You have a vision of what it's supposed to look like, and then when you actually see it, it's like, you're, you're kidding, right? <laughs> There's <laughs> something wrong. Really yes. like, <laughs> something else. I literally, we walked out, there was a friend of mine was with me, and I said, I don't think that's the machine. I think it's a phony. I don't know what that was. Later found out it was the machine, it's just it was dusty, it was dirty, it hadn't been cleaned up. The original console was missing, it had been replaced with one that Tom Sherman had built. And you know, you get to got to love it after a while when you realize it really was the, the real deal and you know what you expected wasn't there, you know. It's Hollywood magic once again, you know. So you, you took some, some reference pictures, photographs of, of uh, the machine back then in the, in the auction, right? Yeah, well, that's interesting, too, because back in the days, you didn't have uh, your instant cameras and stuff like we have now with digital. Right. So I borrowed my dad's 35-millimeter Argus camera that he had from World War II <laughs> and did a quick learn on it, because nothing on that camera was automatic. Right. You had to have a... a a photometer to a light meter to tell your light setting. You had to set all the camera settings on the thing, shoot your pictures, hope for the best, take the roll of film to your local drug store, wait a week, get your prints back, and see if you got anything worth looking at. And by then, it was too late to go take any more. And I, you know, I thought I had what I needed, and I was happy with what I got. So. Can you? Uh... <laughs> Can you fill us in what happened, uh, you know, who, I, I don't know if you know who actually purchased the machine at the auction and what happened to it until the time it shows up uh, with Bob Burns later on? Uh, I was over there when it auctioned off. I didn't know Bob at the time, so I probably didn't even recognize who he was at the time. Uh, I know he was there bidding on it. Uh, the person who did win, I didn't know who it was. 
I don't remember if I even saw the person at the time who did it. But he bought it and was going to do it as a traveling tour across the United States with some other props that he bought from the, from the, at the auction. Uh, I guess it was done in a, in a trailer. So the machine was in a trailer, and they just drove the trailer around town to town and set it up, and it was a walkthrough with that kind of thing. I have found photographs taken of the machine in the trailer, huh. and someone had a photograph of the outside of the trailer that had the name on it, but it, it was such a bad resolution picture, and I haven't been able to get a better resolution picture off of it. But the guy had, who bought it originally apparently lived in Anaheim, and although the story is that the machine was found in a thrift store down there, right? from Tom Sherman's girlfriend, she told me that there was an ad in either Variety or Hollywood Report, or she couldn't remember which, that the guy who owned it was selling off all the props and stuff that he had in the, in the tour. And Tom Sherman went down there with her. They saw the thing and the condition it was in, and... He paid for it, bought it at the time from the guy. Okay. There's a, there's a picture on my website of Tom after he just bought it. And he's got both of his pockets pulled out showing he doesn't have any money left after buying this thing. That's a cute picture. So that's where it actually came from. And then he put it into a storage unit, and I got photographs from a friend of mine who took a lot of pictures of it at the storage unit before it went to Bob. And then they all got together and and fixed it all up for one of his Halloween shows. Right. Bob, uh, has he, he got the machine, he fixed it up for, he had it restored by uh, some prop makers, right? Some some Hollywood, right. yeah. yeah. Tom okay. Sherman, uh, Harvey Mayo, DC Fontana, a bunch of names that I, I don't recall offhand, but there, there was a team of people about okay. six or four okay. people all working on it. Right. And he used it for, he used to have a Halloween show, uh, was it in Burbank or was it somewhere else? Yeah, yeah okay. that is somewhere in Burbank and okay. they, they set up for whatever show, this was a time machine show, they had built right. a um, kind of a lab set up right. and they had a flat set up to look like the lab. Right. And then the actor would get in the machine, they turned it on, and the lights would dim out, and the flats would flip around, and the lights came back up, and now it looked like the cave of the Morlocks. Wow. <laughs> and then they had actors dressed as Morlocks come out and attack the guy, big flash of lights and whatever, and, and you know, I can't remember if he went back to present day or or how they did the, the ending, but it was a pretty impressive show. He's, he's, he did a show like every year for right. quite a long time. Different, yeah, different he's, he's uh, quite the... Uh, the archivist of, of Hollywood uh, sci-fi props, you know, he's he's, yeah. he's the guy. Um, he's got quite a collection. Yeah. Now I understand George Pal attended one of those Halloween uh, showings of the time machine that he did, and actually yeah, got to he sit was there. And... Just the, the night that I went over and saw the show, George was there. I didn't get to wow. see him because he was in in a room with Bob and whoever the higher click people were at the time all gathered around him. So, I, But I did see that he was there. Wow. That so, was he, so he got to sit in the machine and somebody took a picture of him in the machine. And, Correct, uh, yeah. Rest, yeah. That's, rest, that's, that's the only there. time, I guess that's the only time he got to sit in the actual machine, right? Uh, George For what I understand, yeah. He never did it during the production. All right. Since the film, people have always been building these time machine models of all sizes and scales. How many fans do you know have built full-size replicas of the machine? Do you know? Uh, full-size, I think we're somewhere around 17 or 18 wow. that are already built. Okay. Uh, and then there's about four that I know of that are people are working on currently. Right. Wow. That's pretty amazing because people are always saying, oh, I could never build that, you know, that, that would be impossible to build. But um, all it takes, it doesn't take a lot of money, I'll tell you that, because I did, yeah, it, as, I did it, it on cheap. a shoestring. <laughs> but it takes time. It takes a lot of time and, you know, and... Well, you know why they call it a time machine, right? Because right. <laughs> right. it takes so much time to build one. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> That's why well, it's a time machine. <laughs> it took me about five years to build mine, and you know I'm going to go into that later on as to you know how I how I ended up doing it. But we know we we both know Rob Niosi, and how long did he spend on his replica building that? Uh, I think the last count was like 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it was so, going to be a, a, a summer project. Right, right. So it can get, uh, you can get crazy building these things. You know, you can make it as yeah. good, you know, it, it's totally, you know, up to you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently starting on one again for myself that I'm going to keep this time. Right. And decided to try to match what they actually did. You know, some of the materials are going to be different, right. but you know, finishes and whatever, I'm just trying to get it to be what, like, MGM did. You know, if they didn't use brass, I'm not using brass. If they use, they had steel rails. I'm using, oh, yeah. steel. you know, so it's going to look very much like what they did, and right. you can say it's just what they did. You know, right. So, how many full size have you made yourself? Uh, I've done two so far. Okay, and you want to do and one more I'm for your for myself. your own. And actually, it was interesting. Two days ago, somebody approached me, so I'm going to be building another one. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to send me my first payment in August. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's, make sure you document it. That'll be a future show, like, probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That'd be really good. Um, now, in 2002, they did a remake or a reimagined Time Machine uh, movie, and they... You know, of course, they, they like to re-up the, the uh, designs of the props and things. But sure. uh, what did you think of that film and, and that prop? Uh, I like the machine quite a bit. Yep. Um, my major problem with it, of course, is from the original story, like I said earlier, George looked like he built the machine himself in his own workshop. Right. Whereas the new machine, I don't think a single person could build that in a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, maybe they could, but I've seen someone build a really nice model of it that's working and everything, but at full size, that's a lot of a lot of machining, and I know what went into building some of the parts on that one. So that 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 part of it just kind of was lacking for me. Right. And the, the, the storyline was, was, was okay. I think an additional five minutes could have made it in the right places, could have tied the story together a little bit tighter. But I, I got the feeling, I'd have to watch it again to be sure I'm right, but that nobody knew he was building a time machine. Right. You know, right. the original story, he shows the model, he's telling everybody what he's doing. He's got, Hardigan has a blackboard full of equations, but nobody really knows what he's doing about it. <laughs> and so when he disappears, then at the end of the film, where Philby is saying, well, I hope he found what he was looking for, all I can think of is, well, as far as you know, he's lying in an alley somewhere in New York City. You know, there was no indication that I got that anyone knew he was building a time machine, so he yeah. disappeared in time. He's just missing. Yeah. So, yeah. like I said, five minutes could have, could have tied up that problem for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, now there's talk of another remake, yet another remake, so... I you know, saw about that, It should yeah. be interesting to see if they go through with it and, you know, what becomes of it. Do you think the time machine has been a... The time machine prop has been a major influence in the, the whole steampunk era. Yeah, they seem to really want to um, fixate on the machine of steampunk. Um, I've seen some really nice. There's a guy up north. So I'm not quite sure where he's located. Sacramento-ish kind of area, I think. He did a two-seat one. Wow. It's a little more steampunky. It's very reminiscent of the PAL machine, but it's really neat looking. You know. And you know the whole steampunk thing is I think it's a it's it's a lot of fun. I'd like to get more into it than than I've been able to. So it looks like fun. Yeah, um, you know uh, I had my machine for a year at the uh, Shelvin Museum in Vermont, and uh, it was it was it was the centerpiece of a steampunk exhibit, and mm -hmm. uh, and that was a lot of fun. My wife and I went up there in one day, and we just sat you know, in the room where the machine was on the side, not saying anything and just seeing the reaction of people coming in when they first see the machine. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's always amazing to me the effect that machine has on people when they first see it. It's like they, you know, some of them don't know what it is and other ones know what it is and they just have this religious experience <laughs> when, they, <laughs> when they see the machine. And uh, the same thing, you know, I've had the machine here at the TV station for years and a lot of people will, will do a double take walking by the, the door and looking in and seeing it uh, and, and they just don't know what to say about, you know. Uh, and I've had, you know, quite a few people, you, you know, uh, uh, 
well-known people wanting to come in and sit in it and have their pictures taken. So it's it's pretty amazing the, the allure that it has on on, mm -hmm. on on people. You know, it's it's an amazing amazing prop. I think it's one of I keep saying this about all the props we talk about, but it, it really is an iconic uh, Hollywood prop, if not one of mm -hmm. you know, if not the most iconic. Uh, you know, I'm sure many other people will argue with you know like the uh, jo other George Pell films and, and some of the props from there, like the War Machine, the Marshall War Machine, or the uh, you know this, this, I could go on and on, but uh, that machine, uh, it's just it's there. I think it'll always be there forever. You know, I, I think your reaction is really right on because I've, I've experienced the same thing. It's either people know what it is and get excited because they can see one, or if they don't know what it is, they're excited to find out what it is. Right. There's a lot of people, if they look at something and don't know what it is, they just walk away. They're not interested. But when they see this and they don't know what it is, they stop and want to know, what is that? So it, it's, it captures, you know, still capturing attention on, on, and interest, I think. The, the big deal is here is the, the Time Machine film, the 1960 George Pell Time Machine film, uh, I think will live on forever. I think it'll always be shown on television, um, you know, sort of like other, you know, classic films are. And mm -hmm. I think it'll always, there'll always be a, an audience for that because people are always interested in time travel and that whole mm -hmm. aspect of it. Uh, yeah, it seems to be still very popular. Back in the 60s and the 70s, um, ABC used to run it every year at Thanksgiving. Yep. Like, like clockwork. I mean, right. if Thanksgiving's coming, you know, they're going to run the time machine. Right. And that's when I would sit in front of it with a camera taking pictures because I knew it was going to come. You know? Right, right. And even now, Turner runs it. Well, they're 30 days of Oscar. They run it because it did win Oscars for its effects. So that gets included in that. And they usually run at least once or twice more during the year. So right. there's obviously an interest in there. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it'll, it'll go on forever. But here's my question for you, Don. What three books do you think the time traveler took with him when, <laughs> at the end of the film? <laughs> I'm not sure which one he took. I tried to find that out, actually. Okay. Because I have some really good set stills that were taken. And you can actually read titles on some of the wow. books. Wow. Those are all set stills. Yeah. The glitch is there's a, step, a still that shows all the books on the shelf when he's, like, writing his, his letter. It's a set up for that. And then there's a still where the books are on the shelf and the three are missing. Right. I thought it's going to be simple. I just have to find out which three holes there are and look at the other photograph and see what those three books look like. Okay. The problem is, it seems like from the, they shot this film with all the books intact, someone took all the books off the shelf and they didn't put them back on again for the next shot because the books aren't in the same places anymore. Right, right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you do to see them though at the end of the movie when he's bringing dragging the machine back into the house. Yep. The books are on the chair. Yeah. In the machine. Not that you can tell what they are, but they are there. You it's put a, them in the machine, they drag the machine back inside the house. It's a it's a quick shot. You have to look really quick. Yeah, to it's see it's quick. It's it's there. Um, I know. Alan Young said one of the books would be Playboy. So. Yeah. <laughs> now. I noticed behind you uh, a lot of props that look very familiar. Um, oh, yeah. and, and there's, of course, you have that miniature. Is, did you build that, the one in front of you? Yeah, this is one of the uh, one eight scale kits from uh, Alchemy, uh, Alchemy Models. Okay. So it's a it's really nice, really accurate model. Yeah. Of the machine. I'll they have do to. have uh, they have a one sixth scale one out now, which I haven't built, but I do have one of those too. It'd be right. even bigger than this one. Yeah. Um, now behind you, uh, I see clocks. Uh, yeah. Some of those are uh, actual props from the film, correct? Right. Two of them are the two directly behind me with the glass domes on them. Yes. Both of those were in the film. Wow. The um, the Crystal Palace, which is on. I'm looking at my image yeah. backwards. Yeah. The one back here, that one was on his um, on the on the mantle of his of his fireplace. Okay. It actually had a larger dome on it. Then, if you look at it, the clock is sitting on a bigger base and has a larger dome on it. Right. They obviously didn't have the original dome, and they put it under that one. Mm -hmm. The other one next to it is the one that's on his desk, 
you see when he's writing on the on the the calendar, it's in the back corner. Hmm. So that's the two were both actually in the film. Right. The rest of the ones up there are same model, same manufacturer as the ones in the movie, just not the ones that were actually in the movie. Are there any more props? Are you still hunting for original time machine props, or do you yeah, think they're, they're all uh, gone now? <laughs> something, you know, it's, it's hard to find that stuff, because right. um, the MGM auction, of course, whatever they had, it's all gone to the winds, and that's whoever, who knows where that is. Uh, these particular two clocks came from a, a prop rental company that actually rented them to MGM for the show. Okay. And there was two others. There was the... Um, the sundial and one of the other wall clocks, and another collector has those too. Right, right. Uh, other than that, there will one of Yvette Mimia's Wiener costumes came up for auction last year, and fortunately, I didn't see it because I didn't have enough money to buy it anyway, <laughs> so I didn't have to worry about it. Right. But that that came up, but <laughs> but stuff in the film is really rare and, and you know far apart. Well, that's very cool that you have those, and I know you, you know, you, tr you treasure them and you, you're taking care of them, which is really cool. Don, I want to thank you very much for sitting, taking time, sitting with us today and talking sure. with us and talking about one of the most iconic props of history, the time machine from the 1960 film, The Time Machine. So thank you, Don, and uh, we'll be in touch again someday. All righty. Take care. Okay. Take care. I'm Bob Burns, and uh, hi, Carl. How are you? I understand you build time machines. Yeah. I have a few myself, as a matter of fact, including uh, the big full-size one, and about five or six other models, I think, that are kind of cool. One the size of a housefly, literally. Wow. A friend of mine made it for me. You have to use a magnifying glass to look at it. But if you ever get out to California, look me up. You can get a picture sitting in the real thing. Okay, so this is my take on the time machine prop from the 1960 film. So back in 1995, uh, I had a discussion with one of my friends, and we were discussing the Time Machine film. And he said, wouldn't it be cool to have a model of the Time Machine that you could put on your dining room table? And I said, that would be really cool. I said, it would be even cooler to have a full-size Time Machine in your living room. You know, it was a joke. He said, well, you, you couldn't do that. And I said, I bet you I could if I had enough time and money. So the bet was on. So I decided that I was going to build my own time machine. Now this was going to be on a shoestring budget, very shoestring budget. I didn't have any money. I had plenty of time at the time, but no money. So <clears throat> I got some uh, blueprints by taking, at the time in 1995, there weren't many blueprints available of the 1960 film. So taking screen grabs off of a VHS copy of the, of the movie, I was able to get a rough idea and draw out some crude blueprints of the size and the dimensions of the machine. Years later, I was able to secure blueprints, and I came pretty close to the accurate dimensions of the actual prop that you've seen. So what I started with is I started with the base. Now the base is just made up of uh, glued together layers of plywood. And uh, on the top is some Luan plywood. And then I just put some molding around the edges here, which I routed out of two by fours, basically. I actually carved out and routed out those uh, feet that are sticking out the bottom of the machine way underneath there. And I attached those. There's actually dollies sitting inside, recessed into those feet so that this can roll, although the machine is extremely heavy. So once the base was complete, I moved on to the, a, a difficult part, which was the rails. Now, again, I'm on a budget. So these rails are actually... Uh, inch and a quarter electrical conduit. I think on the original prop it might have been an inch and three-eighths or something like that, but uh, this is electrical conduit that I had to bend. My son and myself bent these with an industrial uh, grade conduit bender. We basically laid out on paper the shape 
of these rails and we bent the conduit to match the shape. We had to do it, as you can see, in some sections and fitted them together. And that's basically how the rails went. The engine housing in the back, I tried to use as much recycled material as possible. Uh, I would look for things that were close in dimensions to what I was looking for to try to utilize those in the construction. This engine housing in the back here is basically made of, of wood, Luan plywood over a frame, a wooden frame. And these parts here, these globes, glass globes that light up, are made, uh, fashioned from uh, lamp housings, lamp shades, plastic lamp shades. This is one, and this is a lamp shade from a light fixture also. This device here, which is the drive of the dish in the back, is actually a loving cup on the bottom. This is the horn from an old E-flat or alto horn that was thrown away at the dump. These are some pipes. This is a toy plastic ball, uh, toy dishes, toy bowling pins that I cut in half, glued together. The parts that you see that are more detailed, like these insulators here, uh, are actually molded. Don Coleman got these from molds pulled off of Bob Burns' original time machine. So these parts here are molded off of the original time machine parts. Next we come to the dish. The dish is a story in itself. I searched for over five years. I, I could not afford to have a, 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 a copper or a brass or aluminum dish spun. It would have been thousands of dollars to have a, a, spin, a, a dish spun in this dimension. This is a five foot diameter dish. What I ended up doing is looking, I spent years looking for something that approximated the shape. I looked at, you know, uh, sl uh, snow sleds, uh, I looked at satellite dishes, I looked at, you name it, anything that was around and concave, I looked at. Could not find anything that was this size. A friend of mine, <clears throat> by happenstance, I happened to ask him if he knew of anybody that had satellite dishes. And he said, well, I've got one in my backyard. And I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, I have a satellite dish. It's a six-foot dish that a tree came down on and cleaved it, made a huge dent in it. I've got it in my backyard if you want to look at it. I didn't think it would be worth looking at. I went to his house. I looked at it. It was almost the exact uh, dimensions in terms of the concave uh, form, but it was a little too big, and it had a huge... Uh, dent in the side of it. But I decided to take it anyway because I couldn't find anything else. So I took that, I spent quite a bit of time banging out the dent, and I had to cut one foot off the radius of this dish. This, this is a, it's a, an aluminum dish here. And I was able to cut one foot off of it, and uh, that's how the dish became the time machine dish. All these little things here, there's 365 of these little doodads, uh, which represents a day of the week, a uh, day of the year. And these are all wood dowels that are cut and glued on. These designs were hand painted by me by uh, taking a slide projector and projecting uh, slides of the original design from a frame grab off the film, projecting it onto the dish, and I just traced them out with paint pens and uh, painted the designs on. That's how that was done. This lamp cage here, these are all done by me using brass and soldered together. If we uh, move forward here to the control panel, okay, this is actually a piece of Lucite tubing. Again, all of these things were, were pretty much inexpensive materials that I was able to get. This is a piece of clear lucite, and the reason I wanted clear, it will become evident in a minute, but I was able to cut this. This is the right dimension. I found some, again, lamp shades or lamp housings from fixtures to use on the end caps that light up. These here are glass. I had these ordered. These are glass uh, globes 
colored glass globes. Now in the front here of the control panel, you'll see where the uh, pilot or the time traveler sits, and you'll see the control panel. And that is made so that the display can change depending on how I move this lever back and forth, which also controls the, sp the speed of the dish in the back. It's kind of crude. Uh, again, I was very low budget, but that's why this is a clear Lucite uh, control panel, because you can see right through it to the mechanism inside that changes the, the date when I move this. Again, on the front of this control panel, I had to hand paint that design pretty much utilizing the same method of projecting a slide onto it and tracing it out. Uh, on the side of the rails, we didn't talk about these, but these little florets here, these actually magnetically attach to hide these bolts that hold everything together. And they just stick on magnetically. But this rosette here is actually molded designed off of the original machine and molded. Again, uh, Don Coleman was able to uh, get me copies of this uh, pulled from a mold. So these are pretty accurate to the, to the actual machine. Finally, uh, we come to one of the most expensive parts of the machine. And this is probably single-handedly the most expensive part I had to purchase. I had to purchase this crystal for about $40, $50. This is a Swarovski crystal. And this is a solid piece of brass that I had turned at a machine, a local machine shop. All in all, this lever probably cost me $90, $80 and $90. And that was the most expensive part of anything that I had to purchase separately for this, for this machine. The chair, again, has uh, a story in itself. Uh, the chair in the original time machine prop is based on a 1903 Burning House barber chair. Now, if you are able to luckily find a 1903 Burning House barber chair, uh, you can pay thousands and thousands of dollars for them. They're very expensive chairs because of the ornate carving and the brass work. Uh, my original chair that I had in this machine was something I did uh, very quickly and crudely, and it didn't really, it wasn't screen accurate. So years ago, I actually got rid of that chair, sold it in a yard sale, and I built this chair from scratch, which is a closer replica of a burning house barber chair, which they used in the original machine. Everything you see is pretty much hand carved by me, except for these two uh, end pieces for the armrests. These, again, were taken from molds off of a real burning house barber chair. And uh, a friend of mine, Rob Niosi, who built his own time machine replica, was able to uh, send me a copy of these, which I was able to uh, secure, take molds off, silicone molds off, and uh, mold resin plastic uh, replicas for these ends. So that chair alone uh, was, was almost a year-long project building that chair. In total, I probably have spent over the years, oh, one other thing I got to mention is I could not do the, the upholstery on the chair myself. That was something a little beyond my abilities. So I had an upholsterer do this for me. I think it was in the vicinity of $300 to have this chair upholstered the way I needed it. But all in all, I estimate that the cost of this machine was probably eight or $900 to build, just utilizing materials that you could find anywhere. So I finally finished this machine back in 2002. And once it was done, I decided to put a little film together showing this machine in operation. So let's take a look at it now.
Hello, welcome. I have a project that I've been working on. Right this way. Follow me. Right now, you're probably wondering who I am and exactly what kind of a contraption I'm sitting in. I'll identify myself for now as just a traveler, and I'm sitting in a time machine. I know, it sounds a bit like Steven Spielberg, but let me back up and explain my story. My regular day job is uninteresting, and in my spare time, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, a tinkerer. Well, I guess more like a hacker. I'm always trying to reinvent the wheel and come up with that Ralph Cramden get rich quick scheme. Well, one day I was helping to clean out my great grandfather's house for a quick real estate sale. I came across an old dusty travel case belonging to my great grandfather. My great grandfather was an educator very skilled in mechanical and electrical engineering at the turn of the last century. Living in London, England at the time, he held many patents for scientific devices in relation to accurate timekeeping and chronological measurement and synchronization. Many of his inventions utilized quartz and other crystals for accurate synchronization and resonance experiments. It seemed he was a very mysterious fellow, disappearing for long periods of time, and supposedly traveling throughout the world for work-related experiments. I was a bit surprised, and at the same time curious, when I opened up my great-grandfather's travel case to find notebooks, one of them being a log of sorts, detailing some of his work experiments. One section of this log in particular labeled scalar wave generator for time displacement really kind of jumped out at me. It contained detailed descriptions, sketches, and basically blueprints for the construction of this scalar wave vortex generator. Well, that was all I needed. I jumped right in to try to recreate one of my great-grandfather's experiments. Who knows, maybe I could even sell this device on eBay. Well, it soon became apparent that this device was no simple lab tool, but a Ferrari-sized machine with a cockpit and a seat for an operator, sitting in front of a spinning vortex generator and controlled by a funky, but for his time, state-of-the-art control panel. I went to work securing the needed materials and engineering the components. Following Great Grandpa's logbook was relatively easy. The base for the vortex generator consisted of a copper dish studded with extremely powerful magnets. Recycling an old satellite dish and lining it with copper proved to be a time saver, as well as a 21st century improvement on old great grandpa's design. Not only would this baby create a scalar wave vortex, but I could also probably pick up high def Planet Earth episodes, as well as Ultimate Fighting Championships on the dish, when not in use as a vortex blender. Most of the work was relatively straightforward thanks to Great Grandpa's description and precise drawings. Finding the proper crystals and brass components turned out to be a challenge. Most of the materials were just not to be found at Home Depot. You couldn't get by with an old cut glass doorknob on this baby. We're talking Swarovski crystal. After a bit of Victorian flavored artistic detailing, this machine was ready for a test drive. But what would it do? 
Well, I had to find out. I assembled the device in the only large space I could find at the time, since my garage was being taken up by a 1981 DeLorean that I was trying to restore. My buddy lent me some space in a closed storefront that he owned downtown on Main Street. It used to be a bicycle shop and it had a nice display window facing the street. The finished machine must have looked cool sitting in the window because at times it felt like I was in a George Pal movie with people gawking at me. Anyway, very early one morning, I climbed into the machine and I inserted the control lever. Great Grandpa's logbook did not give much detail on how to operate this thing, so basically, I slowly pulled back the lever and waited to see what would happen. The machine started making a vibrating noise and the disc started spinning. As the speed increased, I started feeling slightly dizzy and lightheaded. I noticed on the control panel in front of me that the date display was changing. Looking out the display window into the street, I started seeing bizarre things. The motions of the people and the cars started to speed up, but in reverse. It was almost like watching an old science fiction movie with cheesy special effects. My lightheadedness was getting worse, and I may have momentarily blacked out or phase shifted or something. I slowed the machine down and stopped it. Something had happened. Something had changed drastically. I was still looking out over Main Street, but it was different. Being an antique automobile enthusiast, I recognized right away that I was no longer watching 2004 vehicles pass by. But 1904-era vehicles were now moving down Main Street, decorated for a parade of some sort. The people, their clothing, the signs, sounds, and everything was 1904. I glanced down at the control panel and I could not believe it. It read 1904. I had traveled back in time. My great grandfather had invented a time machine and I was taking it for a spin, so to speak. Well, at this point, I decided to quickly return to 2004 to make sure that I could return in one piece. I slowly pushed the lever forward and watched as the bizarre effects repeated. I slowly but surely returned to August of 2004. Well, that's my story. And here I sit in a time machine. Over the years, I've been slowly getting used to the machine and taking short jaunts forwards and backwards in time. At this point, I'm a little bit upset. Earlier today, I traveled back in time to find my great-grandfather. I located him easily enough, but to my horror, a terrible mishap occurred, and I accidentally killed him when the horse I was riding suddenly reared and trampled him. Not knowing what to do, I panicked, and I returned back to the present time. Now, I know what you're thinking, but as far as I know, this incident has not affected anything in the present time. Woo, what was that all about? Well, I think I'll take another jaunt into the future. I've met this wonderful girl named Weena, or is it Tina? Well, anyway, I think we've made a connection. Well, you know what they say, time waits for no man. So that's basically the story of my replica. Yes, you can do your own. It's not, it's not difficult. It just takes time. And again, but if you have a time machine, you have all the time in the world to do these things.
Thank you for watching LTV's Top Props. See you next time. Thank you.